acknowledge the fine work of the public servants who have worked together to bring home the Australians who died on board MH17. They have personified the true vocation of the Australian public service. The actions taken in the first 24 hours alone speak of the capability, strength and cohesion of the Australian public service. By 9am on the morning of the tragedy, the government's crisis centre operating out of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade was up and running. The emergency call centre was responding to calls from concerned families, friends and members of the public. By 1pm, 11 Australian officials and a five-member emergency response team who were already preparing to travel to Kiev to seek to recover, identify and repatriate the Australian victims. And by 2.30 that day, the first interdepartmental emergency task force, made up of 15 federal departments and agencies, had been convened. Within 24 hours of the crash, DFAT's emergency call unit had taken over 2,000 calls and consular officials were in contact with <coughs> families and next of kin. Within 48 hours, we had a substantial consular team on the ground in Kiev. Within three days, we had deployed an initial team of 45 officials to assist in the response. As that was happening, Australia was securing international support at the United Nations Security Council for unimpeded access to the crash site. So that because private enterprise is the engine of national prosperity, our policies must be made and directed at making life easier for business to invest in produce, to trade goods and services, and to employ people. That is at the heart the other government's economic action strategy. We know in the marrow of our bones that government should do for people what they cannot do for themselves and no more. So cutting unnecessary red tape and guarding against its regrowth is a vital part of the Abbott government's missions, mission. Every regulation has a cost both to government and to the community itself. Sometimes it's a cost we freely accept because the benefits of effective regulation clearly outweigh the cost. At other times, the costs and benefits of regulation are finely balanced. When this occurs, it's generally a sign that there are two different perspectives which place different values on the need for regulation. And occasionally, there are regulations in place where the cost of ineffective or inefficient regulation clearly outweighs the benefits. Too often, governments have regulated as a response to risk. The knee-jerk reaction is that more regulation mitigates risk. Occasionally it does, Often, it does not. Yet in trying to mitigate all risk, we run the risk of hampering progress and stifling creativity. As Tony Blair once said, ambiguity, uncertainty, the wisdom that comes with failing, challenging your mind and changing your mind are all essential to progress. A risk-averse public sector will stifle creativity and, to, and deny to many the opportunities to be creative. More regulation does not mean more protection. And poor regulation inhibits prosperity. All too often we see an accumulation of good intentions that stifles businesses and community groups. Under the previous government from 2007 to 2013, we saw thousands of regulations added every year. I'm sure there was regulatory growth 
at state and local government levels as well. So the Abbott government is seeking to make major changes to the culture of government. As Gary Banks points out in his background paper for this conference, when it comes to regulation, it's all too often a case of regulate first, ask questions later. The government this year held the Parliament's first ever repeal day. In the 11 decades since Federation, this was the first day ever dedicated specifically to reducing regulation. Our first repeal day in March this year saw 9,500 unnecessary or counterproductive regulations and over 1,000 redundant acts of parliament repealed. We repealed the redundant, the ridiculous, as well as areas where we judged there was an overall community benefit in doing so. To give up one example, films will only need to be classified once not again and again when they are reissued in DVD, Blu-ray or 3D. Of course we need classifications, but the same public servant does not need to watch the same video three times, nor does a payment need to be lodged three times for a job that has already been done. That's a small change, but we're also making all substantive changes. We're working with the states to set up a one-stop shop for environmental approvals so there is less red tape, less green tape, less paperwork and swifter outcomes. This is not a lowering of standards. This is clearer standards and more consistent standards. For example, under the current system, there could be a gap of up to 110 days between the state and Australian government approval decisions. With the one-stop shop, this type of delay would be avoided or minimised. The Australian government would not need to assess information on matters of national environmental significance separately. Instead, the state would seek all relevant information up front and through one application. We are deregulating higher education because universities of all institutions should be capable of running themselves. Repeal day won't be a one-off. There will be another one later this year and we plan more in coming years. Repeal days are the start of a real and lasting change of culture that we are delivering across the Commonwealth. Portfolios are auditing their regulations and estimating the compliance costs they impose on businesses, on community organisations and on individuals. Each minister has access to an advisory committee of industry leaders and experts who can provide a real-world assessment of what to cut, what to keep, to ensure we get the balance right. It's a process that keeps everyone's eyes on our target to, re to reduce red and green tape by $1 billion every year. Because those savings aren't an aspiration, they are our determination. It's not only the growth of regulation that we have to tackle, it's the level of taxation as well. The government wants taxes to be lower, simpler and fairer because no country ever taxed its way into prosperity. We've succeeded in delivering on our election promise to the Australian people to ease their cost of living by repealing the carbon tax. We're working to repeal the minerals resource rent tax, a tax that BHP Billings CEO Andrew McKenzie recently described as a huge disincentive to invest and the repeal and the repeal of which would send a really strong signal that Australia was open for business. Thank you. So said Mr McKenzie. On top of repealing the carbon and mining taxes, we are cutting company tax by 1.5 percentage points 
and we have cleared the backlog of unlegislated tax measures, providing certainty for taxpayers, businesses, and investors, both local and foreign. Looking ahead, we are committed to simplifying the tax system and lowering the tax burden. We will produce a white paper on the reform of our tax system by the end of 2015. This will provide a longer term considered approach characterised by fairness and simplicity. Revenue raising by all levels of government will also be considered, meaning it will work closely with the white paper on the reform of the Federation. The vertical fiscal imbalance between the states and the Commonwealth has been a fraught issue ever since Federation. Professor Greg Craven made the point that the founders were great statesmen and excellent constitutionalists, but by and large, dreadful accountants. In 1902, the then Attorney General Alfred Deakin said the Constitution had left the states legally free but financially bound to the chariot wheels of the central government. A remark that I'm sure all of you have heard quoted many times before. We should be capable of designing reforms to federal financial relations that move more and more in the direction whereby those who spend the taxes raise the taxes. Tax reform is essential. If it is to succeed, all jurisdictions must cooperate to identify problems and bring the community along. But there is much more to the reform of our federation than just revenue raising or revenue sharing. We all know that our federation has great strengths, but it also suffers from buck passing, duplication, waste and inefficiency. John Patterson once described the health system as a tangled web of intergovernmental arrangements marked by incomprehensible complexity. It's a phrase that could apply equally across many shared Commonwealth state responsibilities. Now is the time to make each level of government sovereign in its own sphere. A more efficient and effective federation would have clearer roles and responsibilities, make dealing with government simpler for citizens, and will improve national productivity. We are a pragmatic, problem-solving government, but it is pragmatism based on mainstream Australian values. A fair go is at the heart of who we are as Australians, and for everyone to get a fair go, everyone has to have a go, so we can pay for the services the vulnerable need to live with dignity. If we allow young people, women and older Australians to slip from the workforce, we undermine the productive capacity of our economy, and we undermine the values of our society. There's no compassion in having people start their adult lives on unemployment benefits. Young people should be learning or learning. There's no kindness in letting older people slip quietly onto the dole to age idly until they qualify for the pension. Workers aged 70, aged 50 years and over are valuable, and we're offering a new wage subsidy restart to encourage businesses to employ them. And there's no sense in paying a woman a real wage to go on holiday, but a minimum wage when she has a baby. So the government's paid parental leave scheme will assist women to have a family and stay connected to the workforce. Stronger economic growth is the key to addressing almost every problem at home and almost every global problem as well. John Patterson was described as one of the best public servants Australia has seen. A big picture man, inspiring and knowledgeable. But one of his greatest legacies is his constant reminder to all of us, to everyone involved in public policy, that we are not here for our own self-gratification. We are here to serve the people of Australia. It was said many years ago that of the primary differences between the liberal side of politics and the other, one of the principles is that we take the longer view. We want a better Australia for the future. We want future generations to benefit, benefit from the decisions we make 
just as we have benefited from the decisions made during the Hawke and Howard governments. These are the decisions that build a strong, prosperous economy for a safe, secure Australia. ANZOL is unique in Australia as a national school of government. There is a great tradition of schools of government elsewhere in the world, the Kennedy School of Government and the Bush School of Government, to name just two. A school of government lends itself to the mission of better government, more skilled public servants and stronger democracies. I thank Amazon for all that it does. I hope you have a highly successful conference. I thank you for the privilege of being invited to deliver the 2014 John Patterson Oration.